University. This week on Office Hours, with the Kyoto Protocol on greenhouse gas emissions set to expire in a year, political leaders, scientists, and policymakers from more than 190 nations are gathering this week and next in Durban, South Africa to negotiate issues related to climate change. Among the conference attendees will be Duke's Brian Murray, Director for Economic Analysis at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. At the conference, he aims to share research by the Institute on the Science, Economics, and Policy Implications of Carbon-Gas Interaction with Oceans, Forests, and Agricultural Activities. Murray takes your questions on the state of global climate negotiations. Welcome to Office Hours. I'm James Todd with Duke's News Office, and I am here with Brian Murray. He is the Director for Economic Analysis at Duke's Nicholas School of the Institu uh, Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. And joining us uh, by Skype from Durban, South Africa, is going to be Jeff Gustafson. Uh, he is at the United Nations Climate Talks. Jeff, could you start us out? What, uh, what did you do today? Talk, talk about a, a day in Durban. Sure. So I've been here for about a week. The conference kicked off on Monday. It's a two-week conference of the parties, meaning that all 192 parties to the Kyoto Protocol and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change are here. And we've brought 15 students from Duke to essentially help the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change uh, negotiate to the fullest uh, capacity, their, their fullest ability here at the negotiations. Uh, so we have a, a pretty regimented day where we are working with stakeholder groups that are assisting the, the, the least developed countries and the small island states. Uh, so today, for example, we started out meetings with our client groups, uh, essentially finding or determining our, our, our plan for the day, what meetings we would need to attend, uh, what needed to be analyzed uh, over the course of the day. Uh, we later met with uh, actually a new faculty at the Nicholas School, John Paulson, who will be joining us in the fall and works on tropi tropical ecology and red uh, mechanisms. Um, so we met with him, which was great. Uh, if you could explain red, uh, Jeff, red would be uh, reducing emissions from uh, forest degradation and deforestation. That's right. And Brian can talk in way more detail than I can. Red is essentially a mechanism uh, that would incentivize the saving of forests, uh, bur the burning and uh, the burning of forests, the deforestation of forests contributes a massive uh, a massive uh, chunk of global emissions annually. Uh, red is a, a mechanism through the United Nations that would incentivize saving forests uh, for their carbon uh, sequestration potential. Uh, but again, Brian can definitely talk in way more detail. Professor Murray, this you're about to leave from here, get on a plane and join Jeff in Durban. This will be your uh, fifth of these United Nations climate conferences. Can you set the stage for us? What's the history coming into this? What, what are the issues on the table? Sure, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so the Conference of Parties that's being held in Durban, South Africa, is the 17th of these meetings since the inception of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That, uh, the Framework Convention actually came out of the Rio Earth Summit of 1992, and the first of the meetings was held in 1994. On the third meeting of the Conference of Parties in Kyoto, Japan, uh, a far-reaching international agreement um, was negotiated where uh, many of the world's major countries agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, primarily carbon dioxide, below 1990 levels by 2012. Um, now we're, going, we're, we're on the eve of 2012, and it's time to negotiate or to figure out what the international community is going to do next. So Kyoto uh, Protocol is expiring next year. It is expiring at the end of 2012. And as Jeff indicated, there are 100, this is every country in the world, essentially. All 192 countries are here negotiating, which is a fairly complex treaty. I mean, the science is sometimes complicated. The economics is certainly complicated. And the political... Um, you know, the, the po political positioning is probably the most complicated of the three. Um, and so it's been a challenge to get to this point, but, um, but it, we're really at a critical juncture right now because uh, absent any kind of agreement next year, there is no agreement. There is no international agreement uh, in terms of achieving long-term emission reductions. Now, there have been several alternatives proposed to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, I should point out that, uh, that the United States uh, originally did sign on to the Kyoto Protocol and then withdrew their support back in 2001. So the United States, China, India, 
Brazil are four of the top 10 emitting countries in the world and they don't have binding commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. So a, a strict continuation of the Kyoto Protocol would not achieve its long-term targets if those countries didn't take on some sort of emission reduction commitments. And so are, are you feeling a sense of urgency with the Kyoto Protocol expiring next year? Is that, is that being shared among these representatives? Well, I think there is a sense of urgency by some, but, but unfortunately not enough to move action by others in some cases. Um, there are countries who signed to the Kyoto Protocol and are nowhere near meeting the targets that they agreed to. Uh, Canada would be one. Um, Japan, where the Kyoto Protocol was signed, um, has said that they're um, not terribly interested in signing up to something that's structured like the Kyoto Pro Protocol in the future. So, so it has significant problems. Um, but it's, it's all we have. Uh, I mean, one of the issues was it was structured in 1997 to more or less reflect what the world economic order looked like at that time. And so that meant dividing the world into two camps. You were either an Annex I country, which meant you were a developed country, mm -hmm. rich and high emitters, and were responsible for most of the carbon that was in the atmosphere and therefore should be responsible for reducing that carbon. And then there were the other countries, the so-called non-Annex I countries, who were essentially the developing countries who had not contributed most of the carbon to the atmosphere and therefore were not as responsible for the carbon that was in the atmosphere at the time. However, those are countries like China and India who have, and Brazil that have developed very rapidly and during that period of time. And so one of the, one of the issues with the, with the current status of the negotiations is that the world has changed quite a bit since then. Uh, countries am amounting from uh, uh, almost half the emission, world's emissions or more are not bound by the current treaty. And so there's a sense that more needs to be done. Uh, there's also a sense that not a lot has been done even since the treaty was signed. Jeff, I want to turn to you there in Durban. Uh, is there a way to gauge the mood down there? Is there a sense of urgency uh, about getting something done? Well, I would say that if we look back two years to the Copenhagen conference, the entire world was looking for a solution, uh, an answer to uh, the post-Kyoto regime. And, and as many people remember, as the whole world watched, the conference essentially failed. Uh, nothing came out of it. And, and now countries have worked for months tirelessly trying to set a very, very low bar, a very low expectation for what this conference will provide. So I'd say that the conference is both urgent and hopeless. Uh, a lot of people feel that we won't come to an agreement, we won't be able to replace the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so we're looking at incremental movement forward, a, a package deal that would uh, move the elements of what we agreed to last year in Cancun forward. Um, but I would say that there's very little hope for a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol at this point. Uh, this might be a good idea to actually point out what has been agreed. I mean, it has gotten off to a bit of a dismal start, but I mean, there are things that were agreed to that actually the, the beginning of the agreement was forged in, in, uh, in Copenhagen, and then there was some sort of diplomatic maneuvering that kept it from really being an agreement. Uh, so, but last year in Cancun, there was some solidified agreement on a couple of important fronts. What were those? Um, well, one of them is the establishment of the uh, Green Climate Fund, which uh, was tar is targeted to spend uh, $100 billion a year uh, by 2020 uh, from, by the developed countries to the developing countries for mitigation, which is reducing greenhouse gases, technology transfer, which is helping, um, helping these countries get the means to these reductions, and then adaptation, which is the notion that there's already a certain amount of climate change that is dialed into the future, uh, and countries are going to need to adapt. And the, the under-resourced countries are in, like, obviously a less good position to adapt without financial aid from the developing countries. Um, and, and to put that mobilized more quickly, um, $30 billion was to be committed by 2012, and we're actually on a pretty good track to get that, uh, to get that money in place. Um, the other major agreement was on, on the topic of RED that uh, Jeff alluded to earlier, reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation. And there's a general framework of an agreement uh, by, for a country. So it's, uh, RED is uh, the second or third largest source of emissions globally of greenhouse gases, and it all, almost all occurs in countries that don't have binding commitments on the Kyoto Protocol. So it occurs in places like 
Brazil and Indonesia and other places that have large tropical forest stores. Those are, those are the forests that are being lost, and that's the carbon that's being lost. So there are now financial incentives that are being put in place to compensate those countries uh, for reducing their emissions from deforestation and degradation. And there's still some details to be worked out about the exact mechanisms by which that finance would roll, uh, but, but the general agreement is there, and I think there's some optimism that that agreement will be ironed out with you know, some finality. Okay, and I should say, I think we lost the Skype call from Jeff. We're going to try and get him back. He's just like back. He's back. Uh, Jeff, if we could get back up to speed. Professor Murray was talking about this uh, climate change fund for developing countries, and that's part of your assignment there is to uh, different members of the class have been assigned to different small developing countries. How does this right. climate change fund figure in the interests of, of the parties that you're representing? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just after Cancun, when they decided to create this Green Climate Fund, which would, as Brian said, uh, be a large $100 billion or be an effort towards a $100 billion uh, large commitment from the developed world to finance mitigation adaptation, uh, there were four meetings this year that concluded back in October in a fourth committee report that uh, would essentially spell out exactly how the Green Climate Fund would be structured, how it would operate. And um, that report was not unanimously decided. The United States and Saudi Arabia blocked final approval of that. And so the the committee report that came out of that is now in, before the conference here in Durban. And it's a huge issue. It's one of the biggest elements that, that needs to move forward uh, in these negotiations in Durban. And the problem is uh, that many parties want to move this text, which was worked on all year by a, a diverse array of countries, uh, they, they want to move it forward as is without reopening the text. Uh, reopening the text might potentially allow for uh, stalling and political action that would delay uh, the passage of the, of the fund itself. So for the countries that we're working with, the developed world that, or the developing world that really needs this fund, they need this money and they need it fast to, to implement mitigation and adaptation measures in their own countries. Uh, they need this fund to be operationalized here in Durban. And so what we're working on, or some of us are working on, is, is how, to, how to move this process forward so that at the end of next week when this conference closes, we have a deal on the Green Climate Fund and it's ready to move forward and ready to be operationalized. Uh, unfortunately, there's quite a bit of political posturing going on right now, uh, and the chair has now started an informal consultation process on trying to figure out how to move this forward. But it is a, it is a priority of the South African presidency at the, at the COP to, to make sure that we get this Green Climate Fund at the end of the talks. Jeff, Professor Murray, we're taking questions from viewers, and we've got uh, one that's come in here. And a reminder to everybody watching that you can join this Office Hours conversation by sending an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post the Duke University Facebook page. Uh, we've got an email from a NASA engineer, Peter, who says, at NASA, we're in year two of prototyping a carbon monitoring system with the aim of improving quantitative estimates of carbon sequestration in global forests and total fluxes, land, ocean, atmosphere from all sources. So his question is someone with technical expertise is, who are the end users of this kind of scientific data and what carbon dioxide uh, data is most relevant for policy and decision making. It's the intersection of data and policy from someone doing it. Uh, well, that's I, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that there can be lots of end users of that data. I know the research community is dying to get their hands on that data because it will help them in terms of determining what uh, climate patterns have occurred in the past and will help them model and project what kinds of climate might occur in the future in response to higher levels of greenhouse gases if we indeed go that way. Um, I, I know that you know, one of the challenges I have, so one, one of the things that the Nicholas Institute does is they try to communicate uh, science to policymakers, science and economics, te you know, fairly technical concepts mm -hmm. to policymakers who are very smart, uh, but they work on 150 different things on any one week. And so being able to convey information that gives them sort of an aha moment and says, okay, I think I understand this issue and I think... I, I, I know what we need to do about it. Mm -hmm. So I think any way that you can communicate that information in a way that people will see patterns, uh, they will see um, sort of the locational distribution of problems. So if we see that, um, that 
uh, either historically or in the future that temperatures, say, you know, keying on one important environmental and climate variable, uh, is going to go up by a certain set, of, you know, a certain number of degrees uh, C, uh, mm -hmm. and more so in the northern hemisphere than near the equator, uh, and it it depends on a variety of factors. Which, if we sort of look at variations of that, we'll see how that affects where. The, the increase in temperature and the location of the temperature increases, that's the kind of information that I think people need to get a sense of uh, how sensitive our system is, how fragile um, the environment is to these changes in, in greenhouse gases and, and, and other environmental pollutants as well. So I think anything that NASA can do to communicate that um, very clearly and transparently to both the general public and policymakers would be uh, greatly valued. Is there a, a one number? I mean, everybody doesn't know finance, but everybody knows the Dow Jones average, and that gets reported on the news. Is there a sort of a, a, a big overview number that would be helpful? Yeah, well, I don't think the one that the people would put, you know, look at the Internet you know, 12 times a day to see how it's going is probably the right parallel. But mm -hmm. the, the real sort of key there, if you wanted to make the best parallel to the Dow Jones industrial mm -hmm. average, would be the parts per million of, of CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. Okay. So, wow, oh gosh, boy, well, let's <laughs> everyone stuff. go home and see that. But yeah. let, let me explain what, what I mean by that. Um, in the pre-industrial age, we were at about 270 parts per million of CO2 right. in the atmosphere. And now, depending on what, which gases you mm -hmm. count, we're about 100 parts per million more than that. So okay. it's gone up 40% or so in pre-industrial. Um, and that is what is directly tracked to changes in atmospheric temperature. Um, that, in contrast to maybe some news stories is not really under much dispute that there's a direct relationship between CO2 greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere and temperature and we can see that over millennia. Um, and so some of the projections uh, about where that might head in the future depending on what we believe the emissions will occur and what we believe policies, what policies we believe will be put in place could have an almost tripling of that level by the end of the 21st century. And so climate models are trying to predict what kind of future do we have if we have a tripling of the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, it's, not, it's not good. Uh, um, you know, we have a wide range of climate models. And if emissions tripled uh, from current levels to the end of the 21st century, we would see temperature increases that um, are, w would change the surface of the Earth quite literally. Um, as, as much as uh, up to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, 11 degrees Fahrenheit, Five, four, five, six degrees centigrade, and then the impacts that that could have on on um, sea level, both through glacial melt and thermal expansion of the of the ocean, are could be pretty dramatic. So that's the number, in essence. If you were trying to monitor the health of the atmosphere in terms of climate change, that's the one to keep an eye on. And what counts as a large increase? I was just reading that the Department of Energy put out an estimate of six percent increase in carbon gas in two thousand ten. Mm. Is that a lot? Is that a little? Well, that highlights what, what kind of problem this is. So the emissions in, every, in any year are what contribute to the concentration of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So a spike in any one year is not a good thing, but it, you, know, it, you have to combine that with the increases in all the other years. And so the year before, there was a, there was a decline, a significant decline in the U.S. as a result of the, of the, you know, the recession. Um, but what you, but it's, the, it's the contribution of those emissions to the atmosphere and it's, it's not the emissions per se, but it's the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that caused the warning. So that's what you're trying, that's what you're tr trying to thwart. And, so, and that's why you can actually live with some annual variation and why a climate treaty shouldn't necessarily focus on what happens in any one year. It should focus on what happens over some period of time because it, that's what determines the levels. Good. And I want to hear from uh, Jeff Gustafson there in, in Durban. Jeff, um, how technical are these meetings and presentations that uh, you're going to? You just heard Professor Murray uh, talk numbers here. Is that, are you hearing a lot of uh, stats and scientific uh, uh, language or is, it, um, or is it more accessible? I think the, the numbers that we hear are largely finance uh, at this point. Uh, because of the political disputes largely between the developed and the developing world, we're not likely to get concrete numbers in terms of mitigation targets, meaning how how much uh, countries are going to emit or uh, reduce their emissions by. The numbers that we're really talking about are finance. How much money needs to be uh, on the table for mitigation and adaptation and red projects and, and, and the rest. Uh, so the, the, the technical meetings are largely not at the COP. This is largely a political process, uh, and the numbers that we hear are, are mostly money-related. 
And speaking of economics, uh, you might have seen that uh, Bill Shamidis, the dean of the Nicholas School for the Environment here, recently uh, blogged about the COP conference, and he said that um, with the shadow of the debacle of Copenhagen still lingering, uh, international talks, uh, not to mention a sour economy around the world, expectations for progress uh, are exceedingly low. So we've, we've talked about uh, some of the lower expectations, but uh, he specifically mentions uh, global economy, he, he said most notably in Europe. So uh, how, how does the um, international economy loom in these, in these conversations? Well, you know, I think the, the, the challenge there is, so we, we talked about how the Kyoto kind of broke the world into two camps. And right now, the camps that actually signed on to the agreements and therefore need to be financing the reductions are the parts of the world economy that are hurting the most. For them. Um, and the, and, and the, the, the rapidly emerging economies, um, uh, and those with also the most rapidly increasing levels of emissions, are the, other, are, are the Brazils, the, the Indias, the Chinas, to some extent, uh, South, America, uh, South Africa. Uh, and so those are the countries that, um, are, uh, probably have a greater impact on the future trajectory of emissions. So things are a little bit out of sync right now. So no one's really saying, I mean, some people may be saying, mm -hmm. but I, I think most reasonable people aren't saying, well, that's where the emissions are going to be in the future. That means you need to take care of everything. I mean, there is a sense that, that the developed countries of the world got to where they are in part because they burned through a lot of carbon, and therefore they kind of benefited, if you will, from burning carbon, and therefore they have the responsibility to help other parts of the world either deal with the damages that are caused by the carbon or helping them get off a different trajectory. And so, so again, the imbalance is that the countries that are accumulating more money are the ones who are sort of less responsible for dealing with the problem, at least as the, as the international agreement stands now. We've got a question if, that's if coming. If I could just... Yeah, please, Jeff, you want to add? If I, yeah, if I could just add to that. Uh, on, the, on the ground here, the, the global economy downturn is certainly used as a a way to lower those expectations, but I think there's also uh, noteworthy developments in that uh, the United States has put forward a considerable amount of money towards fast start finance, as has the United Kingdom and, and other developing countries, Japan included. Mm -hmm. um, they have put forward a lot of money towards that $30 billion that we had promised by 2012. Uh, so even despite the, the economic downturn, we have seen some money on the table. It's just certainly not enough. Um, in most cases, it's used as a, a way of tempering expectations, uh, but but we are we are seeing some money being put on the table. Just to put it in context, the hundred billion dollar per year target for 2020 is roughly on par with what the world is spending on foreign aid right now. So, but what we're talking 30 billion right now and one tranche of money, but ultimately the big prize is quite a bit larger, 100 billion, and so that's the agreement that sort of needs to line up. Wow. Okay, we've got a question. A couple questions have come in here from viewers. So I want to start with one here from Kim, who asks, "What is the relationship between governmental agreements and corporations? How can they be incentivized, especially multinational corporations?" Professor Murray. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll start that. Um, so I mean, it's the, the countries, the governments are the ones who are at the table negotiating the international agreements. But how it happens within the country is is obviously going to be determined by the companies who are operating within the country if they're the major emitters. And so if you look at what Europe has done since Kyoto, they put into place something called an emissions trading system. So that all, about half of the emissions in Europe are sort of constrained by this program where there's a limit on how much you can emit from different sectors of the economy, the, in, in the industrial sector and the electric power sector. Every company that operates... It's cap and trade. It's a cap and trade program, yeah. right. And every, country, every company that operates in the EU, uh, in EU countries that are subject to this emissions trading system, are subject to these caps. And, and therefore, it, for every ton that they emit in the atmosphere, they need to have an allowance that they purchase from this emissions trading system to be in compliance with the law. So the European governments decided that that's how they were going to work with the private sector, essentially by regulating them and creating a market for permits in order to achieve. Europe is on target to achieve their Kyoto targets. Now we could talk about whether or not those Kyoto targets were sufficiently ambitious, but that's a different issue. Now turn to uh, Canada. Now, Canada also signed the Kyoto Protocol, uh, but they haven't really put anything into place uh, like an emissions trading system. There have been some provincial level activities that have taken place, uh, but, but, but by and large, um, the government negotiated it, but, the, but there aren't strong incentives within the private sector to comply. And so, of course, they're not complying because in the private sector, you, you, you follow the rules or else you get, you, you get burned, but you're not, and there's some voluntary behavior, but 
to hit the kind of targets we're talking about, it really needs to be something that at least starts as a regulatory mechanism and then ultimately becomes economically rational with or without a regulation. And, uh, and that hasn't happened in Canada, and therefore they are way, way, be as I mentioned earlier, they're way, way behind their targets. And, and I would put that to one you know, political constituency in Europe put together something that forced companies to do some things and another political constituency in Canada did not, and that's why we have different outcomes. So is, is cap and trade seen as the way for regulating emissions? Are there, are there other alternatives? Well, there are, there, I mean, another direct alternative, uh, directly a, a comparable alternative would be something like a carbon tax. And what they both have in common is that they put a price on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, so they provide an economic incentive. I, I don't think, I'm not sure, I mean, I'd be happy to answer questions about the nuances between that. It's something I study a lot. But I think the main message that, that, that the viewer should take home is that they're in many ways similar. They put a price on carbon. Um, but there are, but for instance, in the United States, we had cap and trade legislation that made its way through the House of Representatives, but did, re representatives, but did not make it through the Senate. This is the um, Waxman Markey bill. It's the Waxman Markey bill made it through the House, and then it, it, Senators Kerry and Lieberman uh, tried to advance it through the Senate, and it, it didn't. It didn't happen. Uh, and so, but there are still regulatory efforts underway in the United States under the uh, Clean Air Act, and the EPA has the authority granted to them by the Clean Air Act as as uh, affirmed by the Supreme Court that they could regulate greenhouse gases. So the EPA, as we speak, is putting regulations in place uh, for power plants and industrial facilities to try to reduce greenhouse gases. Uh, there also was a rather landmark legislation signed uh, this year uh, for corporate average fuel efficiency standards where uh, the U.S. is targeting in about 10 years uh, a corporate average fuel efficiency standard of 54.5 miles per gallon, and, and transportation accounts for almost a third of the emissions in the United States. So there are other ways to go about this, but as an economist, and you know, most of my brethren believe that the most efficient way to do this would be to essentially not go sector by sector and say how you can comply, but rather set a target for the entire economy and allow trading across sources to do this in a more cost-effective way. I'd be interested to hear, Jeff, from you uh, being there in Durban, are there corporations re represented? Obviously, it's mostly uh, NGOs and uh, countries, but are the representatives from, say, energy corporations there with you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So there are a number of constituencies or groups of organizations that are represented. And for example, I'm accredited under Duke University, and we're considered a research institute, so a RINGO, a RINGO Research Institute NGO. There's also... ANGOs, the environmental NGOs, um, and, and in, in, the, in the case of businesses or corporations, there's BINGOs, the business interest NGOs, which represent the interests of businesses. So uh, there's absolutely corporate interests. Uh, you know, and and for, for all that's said on one side about uh, the role of corporations perhaps uh, in, in slowing down uh, progress on climate change, uh, there are just as many or more uh, corporate and business interests that are pushing for uh, solutions here in Durban and at home in the United States, uh, pushing for uh, strong regulatory frameworks that would allow for all businesses to compete on an even level moving forward uh, in markets that would be set up under the convention, under a new protocol, for example, or under uh, a, a domestic regime as well back at home. But absolutely, businesses are here just like everyone else. This is, this is really the world coming to one place to talk about one of the most pressing issues for all of us. Uh, businesses are just as interested as everyone else. Could we, we've got another... You want yeah, to say, no, I, I just, you know, I think that, that Jeff raised a, a really good point in that, you know, we tend to think of business as a monolith, but mm -hmm. there are a lot of business interests. Not only are there a lot of you know, if you want to use the term progressive businesses who realize that, you know, the future of the planet is also their future. Uh, but there are business opportunities as well. I mean, one really fairly clear example is a, a business group called the International Emissions Trading Association, AIDA. And they're, of course, very much in favor of these market-based solutions because that's what their members participate in. So it's, it's, it's motivated self-interest. But there are also companies who produce uh, low-carbon technologies who see this as a tremendous opportunity for them to sell their, to sell their goods. And, and so some are there, uh, you know, fighting and others are, are, are you know, but they're or fighting on the other side of the, uh, the divide. We've got another question that's come in from a viewer and a reminder to everyone watching that you are invited to join this Office Hours conversation. You can send an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet your question with the tag Duke Live or post to the Duke University Facebook page. 
So Stuart asks, who do you think is getting the better of the climate debate, most of the world's scientists or the climate change deniers funded by oil and gas companies? I've seen polls that say an increasing number of Americans believe that climate change is not a problem. So skepticism, skeptics, um, what's your read on that, Professor Murray? Well, I, I think that's a fair, it's a fair point. I mean, in that uh, I'd say uh, if we look at public opinion polls and, and we use that as the metric about how the public feels, um, it certainly has changed. Um, I think those of us who have studied the issue more intently are a little bit frustrated by that because we see that, um, um, you know, not that, you know, not that climate scientists have been without flaw, or without blame, um, but, you know, by and large, I think when, when you go into deeper and deeper scrutiny, I mean, it's science is done by thousands of people. Consensus is formed not because a small group of people wants to form scientific consensus. There's more to be gained in science by actually going against the grain than there is by being yet another person who says that climate change is happening uh, in terms of, you know, being able to get published and things like that. And so it, it, I, I am a little bit frustrated by that, but yet I understand that this is an important problem. And, and if people trump up, you know, their claims, then they're going to have to be held accountable for that. I don't like it when every time that we have a drought, every time we have a heat wave, somebody gets on TV and says, this is climate change happening. Because I'm afraid what I'm going to see six months from then is that when we have a snowstorm uh, and in Washington, which happened right around the time right. that things were being voted on by the Senate bill, that the deniers are going to come and say, we are not having climate change because we just had a snowstorm. Neither of those points is relevant, to the, is relevant to the issue. I mean, they're relevant, but they're not speaking to the issue, which is what is the trend in temperature over time? And when we take a look, and it was a very hot year, and it was followed by a year that wasn't quite as hot, and people say, well, I just connect those dots and it's getting cooler, mm -hmm. that's not honest. And I'm afraid we're seeing a little bit, uh, a little bit too much of that. And what about a different kind of skepticism that, that wouldn't say, say, okay, you know, climate change is happening, but... Um, UN climate conferences where everyone burns a lot of gas to get there isn't the way to go about it. What, what about that kind of skeptic? Well, I, I think that's a bit of a red herring. I, I mean, I, I, I do agree it would uh -huh. be, you know, um, I, I suppose it would be nice if all this could be done in everyone's living room, but the reality is you can't really accomplish anything uh, unless you go to a particular place. And for political reasons, they don't always locate them in the most centrally located place. I mean, clearly uh -huh. South Africa is not the most efficient place to hold a meeting like this, but... Africa gets its shot, and Europe gets its shots, mm -hmm. and North America gets its shots, and Asia gets its shots. And so, I mean, it, it, you know, in order to, to, to not say, well, we're going to go to New York every year, or we're going to go to Brussels every year, I mean, it has to be held in different places. I mean, the amount of carbon that's being spent on these meetings, I mean, people like to, it, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket, and it's, it's important. And I think the people who go to these meetings would love for their one day to be um, less necessity to go to the meetings every year. They'd like to see a, a binding international agreement that maybe only takes 500 people every year to kind of affirm. But the reality is right now, there's a lot of interest, uh, uh, interested people coming to the table making sure something happens that they want to see happen. I, I guess there's the, you know, there's the travel skepticism, but sort of more substantially the method, um, you could say, that is an international, a single UN international agreement the way or you know, here in the U.S., I mean, we're, we're down to state and regional agreements uh, around carbon emissions that is sort of bottom up. Is, is more uh, well, I, I do think that's a fair that's a fair comment to make, yeah. which is uh, I think one of the things that's come out of the last few years of international negotiations is is a significant questioning about whether an agreement that involves 194 people, 192 countries, to raise their hand and say we agree is really the best way forward. Um, there has been um, some movement to having um, a focus where uh, agreements are formed between the major emitters, so maybe the 20 largest emitters. It's called the Major Economies Forum right now. And that's where all the emissions are. That also includes some of the countries that aren't uh, party to the Kyoto Protocol, like China. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, that's probably more, it's a lot easier to get 20 countries to agree to something than 192. But it raises the question of whether or not it has international legitimacy. If people aren't at the table, then they're not having a, they don't have a stake in the, in the discussions. And so that's, that's, a, that's a battle. I mean, a lot of people draw the parallel, if, if I could, to, mm -hmm. to uh, international trade negotiations right. and, and how um, you know, p countries can opt out there, but there's, there's some punishment from doing that. In mm -hmm. other words, they may end up paying more for the goods and services they buy. There may not be markets for their exports. Uh, and, and if you violate trade agreements, you can get punished economically. With climate, it's a public good. It's sort of a commons problem. And so if you violate 
the climate agreement, you're supposed to take on a tougher target next time. But if there is no next time, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's hard for there to be binding. So it's a, it's a much more difficult problem to solve, but it does take something like a global trade agreement, uh, but it requires really all of the countries to, to agree. Jeff, I'm wondering there in Durban, um, is there any talk of um, you know, agreements that, that don't go through the whole big group of 192 countries, but um, kind of side agreements, smaller steps? Do you hear any of that? Well, <clears throat> I mean, so let me back up a little bit. Uh, the, one of the greatest things about this process, yeah, it moves slow. And whenever, time, whenever you have this many people at the table, it's going to move slow. But there's something really great about bringing every voice to the table, making sure that everyone, especially the countries that are going to be impacted the most, have a say at the table. And these are the countries that are going to be implementing the adaptation projects. They're going to be the ones facing the brunt of the climate change challenge. So they need to be at the table to design the policies that will impact them the most and benefit them the most. Uh, side deals are not the way to go here at the UN. Uh, a side deal was essentially what we saw in Copenhagen when 25, 28 countries, uh, led by the largest emitters, uh, including our president, Barack Obama, came to negotiate a last-ditch effort when negotiators failed. Uh, you know, but the, when it was presented to the entire body for adoption, the world said, well, no, because there's only 28 of you and there are 192 of us. This is not a deal that was negotiated in our interests. It doesn't, doesn't have legitimacy at the UN level. So back deals uh, are, are not uh, what will move this process forward. Uh, as Brian said, there's the, the G20, the, the major economies forum, Another, another, a number of bilateral talks between the United States and other countries with other countries. Um, but here at the United Nations, uh, transparency and openness is vital. We, we, everyone needs to see what's going on at all times, and everyone needs to be included uh, because the idea is to, to create a deal that has input from everyone. I mean, this is an issue that's caused by everyone, and it's an issue that will affect everyone. So everyone needs to be at the table, and everyone needs to agree. James, if I could, I, I'd like to add to that because I think, you know, uh, Jeff is absolutely right. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there's certain, you know, there has to be a certain sanction. But I think what people have thought about is that maybe that the UN process deals with some sets of issues better than other sets of issues. Um, getting 192 countries to agree on what the specific emissions targets should be for even a subset of those countries is a challenging thing. It mm -hmm. happened in Kyoto, but as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the of the program that a lot has changed since Kyoto. So adaptation, funding, green fund, technology transfer, um, monitoring, all of these things that, that, that I think are well suited to the UN framework. Getting the actual implement, you know, the targets in place um, might be the type of thing that, it, that can be accomplished a little bit more effectively with some of these, you know, side deals. I mean, I, mean, I, I shouldn't say that that's necessarily how I feel, but I, I, there are people whose views that I respect who feel like that might be a more efficient way to deal with this is that you have the UN framework dealing with some issues and then you have these other agreements that are kind of dealing with more focused issues. Okay. We've got another question from a viewer and a reminder to everybody watching that you can participate in this office hours conversation on climate change negotiations by sending an email to live at duke.edu. You can tweet in your question with the tag Duke Live or post to the Duke University Facebook page. So. Dharmawan has written in by email, and uh, his question is, is there any discussion in Durban to recognize and support geothermal energy? I admit I don't know uh, what source of energy geothermal is, maybe heat coming out of the ground. What kind of innovative financial mechanisms could be used to expedite geothermal's development? Is, is this a, 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 a serious uh, form of energy, a kind of green energy? Are there uh, other uh, green energies that um, are sort of more, uh, more practical for this? So if, if I could take a stab at that first. Uh, so geothermal energy is essentially the energy derived from the earth, the heat of the earth, uh, or using it to cool uh, rather than uh, expending ener or using energy to heat or cool uh, otherwise, or using the heat of the earth to generate electricity straight off. So it's, the, it's essentially uh, energy strict from the heat of the earth uh, or the temperature of the earth. So um, this is not uh, a place really where you see very much in-depth talk about specific forms of, of mitigation. So that would be a, a form of mitigation, a form of renewable energy technology that reduces emissions because there are, there are no emissions that come from general geothermal uh, 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 energy production. This is very much the 30,000 foot view of uh, the climate change challenge for the world. It's setting up mechanisms that would 
fund these kind of technologies without setting up specific windows to say X many thousands of dollars will go to just geothermal, just solar, just wind. This is saying that we're going to create large funds that would give access to the developing world to finance renewable energy, period, or mitigation technologies, period, uh, rather than getting into the minutia of specific kinds of energy. Um, so we're talking about everything here in large umbrellas, uh, and, and we should be thankful for that because the, the process moves so slowly as it is that if we bring in you know, smaller, smaller negotiation points, it would probably just slow the process down even more. I mean, you certainly wouldn't want this body setting geothermal targets for specific countries, for instance. I mean, okay. you've got right. countries like Indonesia actually have tremendous capacity for geothermal uh, production and other countries of the, and, and, and Iceland or whatever, but mm -hmm. there are other countries of the world for which it's not um, at all viable. Let me, let me just add one thing to what Jeff said. I mean, the exception to, uh, to the rule, which Jeff's right, the idea is not to go sort of cook up a bunch of technologies for countries to take home. Uh, but um, but in the one case of uh, uh, forests and reduced emissions from deforestation degradation, that actually is a source of emissions that is have that is getting its own separate side agreement because it's such an important source. And it as I mentioned earlier, it brings in countries that are sort of out out outside the agreement, if you will, uh, right now. And not only that, but it has such potentially great leverage on biodiversity and other key environmental issues that this is seen as a. As a, as a tremendous opportunity to use the policy leverage and the financial leverage of the International Climate Agreement to, to help save the world's forests. And in talking about ways of, of viewing and, and limiting uh, emissions from natural ecosystems, you work on blue carbon. Right. What is blue carbon? What is blue carbon? Uh, car uh, blue carbon is carbon that is stored in ecosystems that are close to or on the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so m much of the work that I and my colleagues have been doing at the Nicholas Institute um, since our inception has actually been working on this forest carbon red issue. Uh, blue carbon is very much like that in that, in that these are systems that are, have tremendous stores of carbon. In forests, a lot of it is above ground in trees, but there's some in the soils. In mm -hmm. blue carbon, what happens is there's, there's uh, mangroves and, and salt marshes and seagrasses. They store sediment over millennia and the sediment has tremendous amounts of carbon in it. And that's not in the atmosphere. Well, what, what has been happening in the last couple of decades is many of these systems have been disturbed for things like aquaculture, like shrimp farming uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia. And when, when, these, when these systems are cleared, so if you clear out a mangrove to create a shrimp farm, you, you lose tons and tons of carbon right to the atmosphere, almost right away as a result of this endeavor. And so on a per acre or per hectare basis, if we're thinking about the rest of the world, the amount of carbon you actually lose from one of these systems is it can be three times higher than you get from a tropical forest, which we're, which we're concerned about. Uh, and so there are a lot of people who believe that the mechanisms that are being set up to protect our forests can also be set up to protect these blue carbon ecosystems, which also produce a wide range of ecosystem services besides carbon sequestration. And, and how would you make a comparison with, say, a coal plant? I mean, when people think of climate change, and I think we did it here on this broadcast, you show a picture of a smoke coming out of mm -hmm. a, a coal fire power plant. You don't think of shrimp farming is... is uh, no, what you have to say, what you did before the shrimp farm, uh -huh. um, you might, uh, so, I mean, let's say you burn the mangrove, you know, to get clear. Okay. I mean, so you got smoke, you know, uh -huh. you, you did have some pictures in the beginning of the program of smoke rising from cleared forests. Right. It's kind of what we're talking about here. Okay. Uh, but you also scrape off, say, the top meter of soil, and when you scrape off the top meter of soil, um, a lot of that makes its way back in the atmosphere through oxidiz oxidation very quickly. Uh, so you might not be able to see some of the carbon dioxide in one case uh -huh. when it's not smoke, right. but it's getting there. Jeff, I'm wondering uh, there in Durban, how much of the talk is, is around this preserving carbon that's already in the ground, these scenarios that Brian's talking about, versus uh, limiting emissions from um, you know, energy production? Huh. Well, as I, as I said before, this is it's almost gridlock on mitigation targets in terms of reducing emissions from existing uh, energy production. And, uh, you know, and one thing to remember is that the Kyoto Protocol doesn't even touch the developing world where most of the emissions are coming from now. Um, so in terms of eliminating em emissions from the current energy infrastructure of the world and the growing energy infrastructure of the world, uh, very, very little movement on that. The chance that we will leave here with new targets uh, like Kyoto style targets is, is very little. So a lot of effort and a lot of excitement is going into mechanisms like RED and 
uh, and soil and the blue carbon issue. Uh, all of these are on the table. Even ca carbon capture and sequestration was on the, the negotiation agenda today. Um, because we're, we're okay, so we, we have quite a bit of, uh, of, of work to do in terms of the energy sector. So what else can we do? We're, the one thing that we, I don't think we've mentioned so far is that this is really a ticking time bomb. And this is an issue that, despite the slow progress in negotiations, is not getting any better for the world. In fact, it's getting worse. And so uh, we need to move forward on something. So if we can't move forward with mitigation uh, reduction targets for countries, then we're going to have to come up with other ways to sequester that carbon. And red and blue carbon and soil uh, and CCS even uh, are all ways that we need to at least explore and start moving forward. And I would say red is, and uh, land use issues are definitely the most exciting piece. And, and quite a bit of movement has been made on uh, and progress made on, on these issues in the last year or two. Could, I, Please, I mean, I don't, if we have a minute, I, yeah. I, there, there's something that we haven't talked about thus far um, that you know, I think the, the viewers might want to know about. Um, and we, we've talked about the developing world as being kind of completely left out of this and not really having any obligations and, and under the Kyoto Protocol. In some senses, that's true. But there's something called the clean development mechanism, which is um, a way by which uh, emission reduction projects or, car or, f or carbon sequestration projects actually can be set up in developing countries and financed by developed countries as a way to help them meet their commitments under the Kyoto Protocol that have actually sent billions of dollars uh, to the developing world to set up these projects to reduce greenhouse gases. And so we actually do see some renewable energy technologies that are being um, developed and advanced in different parts of the world that are being financed by the clean development mechanism. Um, for a variety of reasons that have to do with technical details, this hasn't been all that successful in actually establishing forests uh, under the agreement. Um, but they're looking to um, reform and refine this clean development mechanism so that more action can be taken. A lot of what would happen in the first uh, uh, go-round of the clean development mechanism uh, were uh, a small number of activities occurring in China of certain gases that that didn't that, that achieves their greenhouse gas objectives, but maybe not some of their other development objectives. And so they're they're, re, they're reforming the clean development mechanism to try to uh, to to have these technologies be disseminated to different parts of the world that will help in their economic development as well as their environmental protection. Great, we're we're well into this uh, office hour, so I want to wrap up with a question for each of you. And Jeff, I want to start with you. Uh, we should emphasize that you were there in Durban. Uh, is part of a class, the United Nations uh, Climate Change, uh, with Professor Elizabeth, uh, sorry, United Nations Climate Negotiations Practicum, Professor Elizabeth Shapiro. Uh, talk us through, you're, you're representing a, uh, a country there. Talk us through what you're learning, how it's structured uh, being in the class there. Yeah, absolutely. So some background. This is a, an entirely student-driven process. It was a, a proposal that was put forward uh, months and months ago, and it's finally come to fruition. We've brought in a, an excellent team of faculty from across the university all semester to bring students up to speed on all of these issues. I mean, this is a really complex process, ranging from mitigation to adaptation to finance. Everything is in this class, and we've brought in people, uh, great, great faculty and staff from across the university, including Brian, to, to do that. And we've also plugged the students in with uh, stakeholder groups representing the least developed country bloc, which are largely African and Asian countries. And which is your country, the, Jeff? What was that? Which is your country? I'm not working with a specific country. Okay. I'm working with a whole bloc. So okay. I'm working with the small island states, uh, largely in the Pacific Ocean. These are countries that are very, very low and are very, very susceptible and um, large, likely to be very impacted by the rising sea levels and increased storm intensity. We're talking about islands going underwater that are so, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, right along the water level, uh, atoll countries. Um, but I would, I would just want to also say, if I can just take another minute to say that, you know, this is an issue is that's never going to, it's not going to go away, and it's going to be dominating the careers and lives of the students, including myself. Uh, and so it's incredibly important that young people are, are, are educated and 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 prepared to take this challenge on from, uh, you know, the, the current people running the system. Uh, and so the class is really exciting because it's, it's putting students in the, you know, the middle, the front lines of these talks, giving them everything that they need to be able to, to pick up the, uh, you know, pick up the baton when it's handed to them after graduation. And 
we've been we've been having a great time. We've been meeting great people, and we've been learning a lot and helping the process. So hopefully, in a week, we'll have you know a, a, a good uh, a good show of progress on the talks, uh, and we'll and we'll bring it home. And that's the other half of it is that we can bring home our experience to domestic policymakers and really say like this isn't just about uh, you know U.S. targets and U.S. climate action. This is a, these are actions that are an impact people all over the world, people that we're meeting here, people who are going to feel this more than we are in the United States. And, and, and we're putting in a little piece of that and, and gaining so much in return as well. Great. So it's been a fantastic time. Great. Your class is uh, blogging there from Durban, so we'll try and uh, tweet that out, a link to that blog from the Duke Office Hours Twitter account. Professor Murray, you're about to leave from here, get on a plane and uh, join Jeff there in Durban um, we've talked some about uh, some overall pessimism. You're going to be representing the Nicholas Institute. So what are the aims that is, you know, as one person among many delegates, what are your personal goals for, for attending the conference? Well, um, I, I think I'll, I, I will get to that by first saying that um, I think this is why Duke is a great university. Um, I think that we have, first of all, we're all behind the mission of knowledge and services society. We have highly motivated students like Jeff. I mean, Jeff almost single-handedly made this happen. I mean, we had students there last year. We had students there the year before. Um, and they, they were kind of there. They were observing. Um, and I think getting a lot out of it, but they weren't necessarily acting. And Jeff has really uh, been instrumental in getting these students to act. And I think I think that says a lot about Jeff. I think it says a lot about our students and, and the kind of people that we we have here. Um, I think the university understands the importance of us connecting to the policy world, which is why they created the Nicholas Institute six years ago. Mm -hmm. And so our mission really is to go and to bring the best that Duke has to offer to help influence environmental policy decision, help inform. I mean, we don't mm -hmm. go there, we don't lobby and advocate, mm -hmm. but we do, we do try to inform. And so that's my goal. I mean, we have specific research projects that we worked on whether it's related to forests or whether it's related to blue carbon or to agriculture or broader energy efficiency issues. And, and we, we're, we're bringing that. We've, we've got reports in advance that we've sent. We have a network of people down there. I'm going to be carrying some more reports with me. I'm going to be speaking at several engagements. And I usually I go to these things. And, you know, in terms of your originally that we burn a lot of carbon to get there, I burn a less I, – my carbon footprint per meeting that I hold there, and these are important meetings, is probably a lot lower than they would be if, unless I really stayed at my house here. But I go to Washington a lot. I think I burn a lot more carbon per meeting going to Washington than going to South Africa and holding, say, 40 different meetings with people. So, Got you. Professor Brian Murray, thank you for uh, holding these online office hours. You're welcome. Brian Murray is Director of Economic Analysis at Duke's Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions, also a research professor in Duke's Nicholas School for the Environment, and we should say a Duke alumnus. You got your, your PhD here. And Jeff Gustafson, thank you for joining us via Skype from Durban, South Africa, the UN climate negotiations. My pleasure. Jeff Gustafson is a graduate student in Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment uh, from Danville, California, and uh, you are in Durban with Professor Elizabeth Shapiro's United Nations Climate Change Negotiation Practicum. Everyone watching, thank you for joining us and sending in questions. A recording of this Office Hours conversation will be posted on the Duke On Demand website. That's ondemand.duke.edu. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.